welcome to season two of the Crypto Pulse podcast, your ultimate guide to the world of crypto, Bitcoin, and world economics. We're here to guide you through the crypto universe with thought provoking topics, in depth knowledge, and information to help you make informed decisions. We'll also be interviewing some of the best minds in the industry, such as CEOs of crypto projects, traders, economists, authors, and development teams from around the globe. And now for the episode. This episode is brought to you by Yield App and daily compounding interest on your digital assets with its intuitive web platform and their newly launched mobile app, which is available for download on both iOS and Android. Plus, don't forget to refer your friends to earn extra rewards. Visit yield.app for more information. Hello and welcome back to the Crypto Pulse podcast for another one of our weekly episodes. But this week we're doing something slightly different, aren't we, Ben? We are doing something a little different, something which we don't do often on the show, which is talk a little bit about us and our, <laughs> our, our journey in this space. A lot of people have been asking me um, that, that like people that I meet at events and people that I meet in everyday life that know I'm in crypto, what else mm. I do and what else I've done. And it's quite... Is that's quite alien to me because you know the people that have known me for a long while know that I do this but all of the other things I've done too and I would imagine your life is very similar in that way and I'm I thought because we're like episode what I think this is episode 51 52 of season two we're yeah. quite far into season two now I can't believe they've done that many episodes already and we've picked up so many new listeners that don't necessarily know anything about us and why we do this podcast in many ways, um, and how it all began. So we thought we'd give everybody a little bit of context. And this is an idea from our producer, Cal, and I think it was a, a really good one. Um, and we, we promised to keep it under four hours. <laughs> it's it's a hundred percent going to be under four hours for sure. <laughs> I mean, you're you're right though. There's so so much to talk about, and mm. um, and and kind of outside of crypto, we've done a lot. You know, you and I have both built businesses separately. Um, you know, really in the last five years, we've kind of come together and have built businesses together. Yes. And crypt, Crypto Pulse is really one of the, you know, it started off really as a bit of a passion project for us, didn't it? In 2017, it was an opportunity for us to learn more about cryptocurrency, blockchain, and just to understand the space a bit better. And we had a lot of really great guests on the show, some people that came on that kind of enlightened us and taught us some great things. We met a lot of brilliant people um, through networking events and kind of meetings that we had. Mm. Um, but I feel like we've sort of taken all of that learning and sort of come back with season two um, with a slightly you know, a slightly different approach. Um, but that's to say we're sort of, we're still doing all of the other things behind the scene. You know, you and I have got a joint business together and of course other businesses that we run. So it'd be interesting, I think, to kind of talk about that stuff. So I promised you that when we jumped on um, to have a chat today that I'd tell you an interesting fact. Oh yeah, please do. Um, so the interesting, interesting fact, fact is, it's exactly five years today that mm. I bought my first ever crypto. And how is weird really? is that? That like that I did not know that until it came up on Facebook and I just saw wow. a post, um, which we'll probably talk a little bit later about how we got this thing going. Yeah, my first ever crypto was Litecoin in the summer of 2017. Yeah, well, I actually remember that day quite well because mm. um, I'm sure you won't mind me sharing that that was sort of one. You and I had worked together, um, I mean, over 10 years ago now. So I, I had... I used to work, you know, the, the the nine to five job, but I had a graphic design agency on the side and I was a one man band and worked with small businesses, entrepreneurs kind of doing logo design, graphic design and, you know, lots of other bits, websites. And you came to me one day with some bits of work that needed doing. We worked together a little bit on a project, uh, helped with your website for the, for your main business. And after that, we didn't really have a lot of contact. I think it was probably a few years that went by after that, where we didn't we didn't see an awful well, lot of each it was other. A you were sort of, of years, but I want, I want yeah. to go back to before this because there's quite a, mm. there's quite a pivotal moment that I think 
um, united us in some way. And I remember the day, and it was a day that we, uh, pretty much the day we first met. Um, and we had a mutual friend at the time that sort of introduced us. For whatever reason, he needed to come to my flat. I had this little flat in um, yes. just off White Ladies Road in Bristol. And if you're not from Bristol or the UK, you won't even know where that is. But it was a, re it's a really cool location. And it was, yeah, it was a nice um, flat. Yeah. And, and I had this little box room that I managed to squeeze a desk in and a chair mm. and uh, a laptop. And this was like maybe 2000 and... 10, 2011, something like that. Mm. Um, probably 2011, actually. On the wall, I had this check written to myself, from myself, for £1.25 million. Pounds. I remember, like, years later, you telling me that that struck a chord with you because you're like, I've never seen anybody do that. And I put that on my wall because I wanted to yeah. manifest wealth. And it was an arbitrary amount I came up with. And uh, I can't mm. really even remember how I got to that figure. But it's interesting how you put that intention out into the world and how well, how we've just started working together. So, I, so it's, I think I was just trying to manifest the right people in my life as well which was what which, which is really cool so yeah well it, it absolutely worked i mean i i remember it and i was 22 at the time which you know feels feels quite young i was working a full-time job i had a second job as a barman uh i was also getting my graphic design business off the ground and i remembered i remember just being really ambitious and i was reading books like all the old classics like the secret which talks about manifestation right. and how to use it in your day-to-day -day life i got that from the secret actually right that's yeah. it and i i remembered walking into your place that day and uh and i think you were quite a sort of a young business person at the time as well i think you were really just sort of finding your feet i was right at um, the beginning of my recycling business maybe we'll come on yeah. to that in a bit because we're gonna yeah i think it's a good place story with that that one but yeah i was right at the start i'd i'd recently moved to bristol i'd only been there a year or so yeah but i i remember seeing that on the wall and um and remember just asking you about it and you sort of explaining why it was there and um and it was good I, mean, I think it was probably the first time that i'd ever met somebody that was as ambitious as i was and mm. as open about talking about that kind of thing you know i think i'd i'd met a lot of people where talking about wealth was really a, a frightening subject or it was something that you didn't really approach mm. um and i think when you're trying to build wealth personally i think to not be able to talk about it makes it just makes it next to impossible so I, yeah, I, I remember it struck a chord with me and it was, um, it was something that stuck with me for sure. So then I, I moved away for a bit. I moved to Northamptonshire. That was again for another, for, for my recycling business, which I'll probably explain in a bit about that. But um, we then tried to work on another project, which was um, something called the Human Revolution. And um, yeah. it was a guy that I'd met that, um, he was a coach actually. He was one, uh, one of many coaches that I've had in my life. And we tried to ignite something there. We tried to work, like we did. You, you, you came with some like marketing pedigree. You came with like, you knew how to, so, sounds so silly, but back then knew how to build websites, knew some of the tech stuff that I didn't know. Yeah. And I thought you'd fit really well into that arrangement. It wasn't to be for many different reasons. There was yeah. just, it just was never going to happen. There were too many, too many obstacles in the way. And then, and then that was it for probably a few years, really. I think, I think we probably mm. spoke on, Facebook, maybe even WhatsApp or something or text. Um, and yeah, we just kind of maybe saw each other a couple of times when I was in Bristol, if that, because um, yeah. your business did some work for me in what, 2015, 2016? We did. You yeah, well, that, that. And stuff. that was when we kind of started chatting properly again, wasn't it? It was, yeah. And I, I remember, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was... Um, that was sort of right in the middle of my of my main business, my main business in the music industry. But I, I was going to say, you say it was five years to the day that you bought your first cryptocurrency, and I was going to say that I remember the day yeah. because I I remember you um, putting a status out on Facebook asking if anybody knew anything about cryptocurrency or if anybody was investing in it already. Well, you and, this uh, up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, but I but I rem I mean it was you know it was an innocent question. I think it was a time where kind of like the first movers were kind of people that were interested in innovation were just picking up on this stuff, 
And uh, I remember just messaging you and saying, yeah, absolutely. Like, it's something that I've been interested in for a while. We chatted quite a lot about, you know, setting up exchanges, setting up wallets, how it all works, like, what I literally it is. had no idea to mm. how to set up an exchange. So I had the, I was sat in my my office in Northamptonshire. So in 2010, I set up a plastic recycling business and I that's was my first real business and that's been like yeah well what an experience i still co-own that business now even like 12 years later and it's taught mm. me so many lessons um i've made many mistakes with that and also had many successes but we've we've helped recycle over a hundred thousand tons of plastic for uk businesses it's insane so we've done an enormous really incredible job for the environment we've launched people's careers um it's helped me financially it's really stabilized me in that respect and anyway that's that's gone through various different phases and reincarnations over those 12 years but i was sat in my um we set up a sales office in 2017 in northamptonshire right near the um the f1 circuit in silverstone right very near there and yeah. um, I was looking uh, at something on Facebook as part of um, a, uh, a mastermind group, like for entrepreneurs. Mm, I remember. And yeah. somebody in there was talking about Litecoin and crypto. And I knew, I knew about Bitcoin. I didn't know anything about it. I'd heard it about it but i this guy was saying oh litecoin's the new thing it's like only like 15 dollars or something so <laughs> i was like i'll just chuck 100 quid in like a total noob like total mm. noob had my coinbase app bought my crypto then we started chatting and i you were like oh yeah there's loads of cryptos go on coin market cap i was like how are there so many how does all of this work and yeah. i couldn't figure out how to set up a, an exchange and you kindly um talk to me through it and we set up a cryptopia account do you remember them <laughs> i do remember i do cryptopia? remember cryptopia yeah oh. i think we actually did we not interview the ceo yes. of cryptopia yes, in season one yeah yeah very very yeah. um but it but it wasn't long after that interview that they went into liquidation <laughs> Well, they had a massive hack and all of the funds were taken. And, they did, um, I know. Well, I don't know what the outcome of that was, but basically... No, same. Well, there's a lesson, yeah. No, not, right. Not your crypto, uh, not your keys, not, not your, your crypto. Not your keys, not your crypto. So yeah. I had some shit coins on there. I think I had some, like, investment feed one. It was, uh, a total it was shit feed. Coin. I think, I think that was the feed. ticker. Invest it feed. was feed, invest oh. feed, yeah. Uh, and there was... Uh, something called bitcoin green as well or something <laughs> i remember you know that. and i was like oh yeah green a really like sustainable thing i should get some of that um, mm. another total shit coin i mean cryptopia mm. was like a hotbed for shit coins really wasn't it um yeah it was everything day. seemed to get listed so it's, it's funny but we we really started this podcast i think for a couple of reasons one we've always wanted to work together um mm. and it was a little bit of a test run so i think that we um, we're both cautious about going into a business relationship like do it and doing something big too quickly because we wanted to yeah. kind of gauge each other mm. and find each other out a little bit. And, and also uh, we wanted to find out more about this space because we were both totally fascinated by it. And I think I convinced you to do this. Um, yeah. Not that you took a lot of convincing, <laughs> but you, you said to me, I'm more of a behind the scenes person. I was like, no, you'd be an amazing co-host because you know so much already. And we did the first what the first couple of episodes um and i think the first episode was done in my hotel room in paris because i was flying to paris and then on to um brisbane in australia yeah i was going to say i remember the second episode you were in australia and i remember you were trying to find a quiet place to record inside yeah. in this house and i yeah. think eventually you succumbed to the fact that you were going to have to sit in a broom cupboard and balance your microphone in a shoe and i think I that's where i've still got the <laughs> picture somewhere yeah and we had like uh, almost no listeners at all and yeah. we were just putting stuff out on twitter and we we're just finding our way with it the sound quality wasn't that good if you want to laugh you can scroll back on spotify and on apple or stitcher or our website wherever you're listening to this have a listen um, and yeah. listen to some of those um those ones from years ago because mm. they'll, they'll make you laugh and it just show how far we've come so that's how season one crypto pulse started and then we started interviewing guests and we got loads of momentum and we had some very, very big guests on with big following and then more people followed us and we got invited to speak at events and that's, that's yeah. kind of how it all it all happened. And we were, we learned a ton, didn't we, really? We learned an absolute 
shit ton. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it was a bit of a baptism of fire, really. I mean, mm. we really threw ourselves in at the deep end. Um, but it was it was brilliant. It was a whirlwind. I think we did, I mean, it was over 120 episodes in season one, wasn't it? I've got a question for you. Who, who was mm. one of your, like, who was your or one of your favourite guests of season one? Who really stood out for you? Mm, it's a good question. Do you know, I have to be honest, my favourite guest probably was Marco Robinson. He, oh, he probably, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. I'm serious. He, he, prob- he probably was. I think he, um, you know, this is a guy that had spent a lot of time in the media. He'd obviously done a UK TV show where he gave away one of the homes in his property portfolio yeah, to somebody in the UK. Free. Yes, get a house for free. Uh, he, I think he saw an opportunity in the crypto space and sort of jumped in with two feet and started uh, promoting this, uh, this project, Naked Dollar. Uh, but he was fascinating. Yeah. Okay. I didn't expect that to be your answer, actually. But but I, I he's ve- he's very charismatic, um, and he's just a very interesting character. Like we didn't mm. we didn't have anyone like him, did we? Really? No. Um, no, definitely. And I also think because we kind of knew a little bit about him and we knew he had a kind of media presence already, I think it it sort of made it a bit more exciting for us. I think he was probably the first guest that we had had on the show that had come with his own sort of following. So I think one of my favourite guests, well, I've got, I've got a couple of favourite things that, that we did. One of my favourite guests was Eric Hopp, if you remember Eric yeah, Hopp. Yeah, I remember um, Eric Hopp. Because I found him yeah. very entertaining. From, so, from the IOTA Foundation. The IOTA <laughs> Foundation. It's a blockchain without the block. <laughs> and the chain. But the chain. <laughs> Um, he was just quite entertaining. Um, mm. And I also really loved doing the payments race content that we did with, with Wire. Max. Yeah. yeah. So um, for, those, for those of you that don't know about this, somebody had to travel from, I think it was New York to Vegas using a set like type of money. So yeah. maybe it was cash, maybe it was check, maybe it was crypto. Mm. And Wirex sponsored Team Crypto and we covered it. We covered Max trying to get from New York to Vegas only using crypto, which was interesting. Um, And we caught up with him through that race and he won. And that was just some, I mean, it was a lot of hard work actually, because we had to, it was so funny. We had to dial in to speak to him using a phone. So I had this like weird hookup where I had to connect the phone to some microphone input output box. And anyway, we managed we managed to pull it off and that was a mm. really cool thing. I'm not sure whether I want to do that again because it was quite <laughs> quite hectic. But yeah, season season one was a blast. Um and I think one of the highlights for me was right at the end of season one is that um I went to the Wirex rebranding um, and did. relaunch night and I hosted their event. You know, I, yeah, I basically presented. MP'd for them and uh, yeah, presented and introduced people. And um, yeah, it was it was strange because, you know, a couple of years before we were we were noobs in the space and um, we we gained ourselves a bit of a reputation. Of course, we did that talk in London with Didi as well, didn't we? Didi Tayuti. We did, yeah. I think we we went in and talked about uh, the evolution of um, the streaming, digital streaming sector, I think. And we kind of likened that to, I think we called it blockchain or bust, didn't we? And we talked a little bit about Blockbuster, which of course was the uh, VHS rental store and the story about how Netflix tried to buy Blockbuster um, um, Blockbuster thought that Netflix was a complete joke and uh, would never take off. But actually, <laughs> uh, what, did they know? <laughs> what did they know? Yeah. So I think the moral of the story was that in order to really understand a space, you need, you throw, you need to throw yourself into it. And we did that hardcore. Mm. And it's really, really paid off for us. We did so much work for free. I mean, it was only... Yeah probably after a year we even managed to get a sponsor so wirex were kind enough to sponsor us which really really helped you know because we were did, yeah. we were spending hours and hours on this for free and we had other business mm. commitments and um but i was convinced if i knew more about the market where i put my own money in terms of like buying different cryptos i'd be able to find the right ones and look at what other people are doing and you know it turned out that we had a couple of years to feather the nest and then you know when the bull run came at the start of um 
at the start of the last ball run then you know we had a nice pot there which was really good so i think without all of that hard work for free we wouldn't have been able to get into that position which is quite interesting yeah, I agree. I th- I think it's been a very steep learning curve. I mean, even with For the sure. bull run that we've just had, you know, I think mistakes were made, but it's been um, a brilliant opportunity to really just kind of like double down on our learning. And I think perhaps this cycle, which we didn't have last cycle, is a better understanding of technical analysis. We understand market um, macro markets. We understand how it kind of plays into the central banks. And I think we were probably missing that last time. I think we kind of, um, you know, we probably treated the crypto space a little bit like a casino, you know, it's sort of like you put your chips on red and hope that it, hope that it plays out. (laughs) Um, but I think as we've become more, uh, mature as, as business people, uh, and have a better understanding of macroeconomics, I think our, our sort of investment thesis has improved considerably. And that's not to say that we get it right all of the time, mm. um, because we definitely don't. But as we always say, I think really, whenever you're, uh, whenever you're sort of speculating like this, you only really need to get it right 51% of the time um, to, to win. I asked you earlier, like who your favourite guest was, but Mm. Who are some of the people that you really admire in this space? Because there's a lot of charlatans, a lot of crooks, a lot of people that I just weren't wish weren't in the crypto space. But there's some also some phenomenal leaders and entrepreneurs. So, is there anybody that particularly stands out for you that that you, that you think has done a great job or or has inspired you in some regard? Do you know what? There are so many people that inspire me in this space. I think leaders in the crypto and blockchain space are are real innovators Mm. and they're people that have jumped into something where there isn't really a blueprint for how to build anything and there are you know founders and ceos like cz at binance that has that has built a business and really carved out an industry which just didn't exist before mm. um he's, he's a guy that's gone out and solved the problem so that other people don't have to you know there are now um you know there are blueprints for other people to follow so i think i think anyone that's doing anything that's completely unique and doing it with some integrity um doing it for the purpose of you know benefiting humanity and not themselves uh and there aren't that many honestly but but cz i would say is definitely up there yeah i agree he i mean what a phenomenal entrepreneur yeah Um, absolutely what about you well that's that is a very good question um i would say i would say definitely michael saylor i respect because he has just got balls of steel i Mm. mean it's unbelievable um I really, really like Andreas Antonopoulos. He hasn't yeah. been around. Like I haven't seen much from him the last couple of years, but he was somebody that I learned about Bitcoin from. I watched so many of his talks on YouTube and his explanation and philosophy behind Bitcoin. He, mm. So he helped me really understand what it was. And I think anybody that stands up for what they really believe in, you know, I um, yeah. I, so I'd say I'd say those two. There, there's there's definitely some others, but I'd say they're they're probably two standout people that for me because they're not doing things to make their life easy. They're doing things that are hard and difficult, and they're pioneers and they're leading the way for others. And I find that very inspirational. Yeah, and anybody that can sort of uh, bring people into the space, I think that's the really difficult thing. You know, as we kind of Absolutely. go through this adoption curve, it's. Um, you know, it's about building a space that can be trusted. You know, if we want to get to the stage where half of the world's population are relying on blockchain technology and using cryptocurrencies daily, then we've got to build the foundations have got to be really solid. Um, and I think there are a few business leaders that are that are building, you know, really incredible things yeah and without them there is no market you know and mm. there's, like, we don't get to do this we don't get sponsors you know we don't get the opportunity to um invest into the market either so yeah yeah i, I agree should we do um a few questions for each other like so yeah because i, yeah, I want to i want to ask you a few things um okay. like, things that i want to know and i think things that um our listeners would like to know um yeah 
and I'm sure you've got some for me, but I obviously I know a lot about you, you know, cause we're very mm. close. Um, and I, I know about your business history. You've, you've built a, uh, a, a business in the music industry and you mm-hmm. um, opened a, an office here in Bristol and then you opened a studio over in yeah. LA, which is an amazing achievement. You raised money for that. You built mm-hmm. a music industry app. Um, yep. but, before you got into business, so when you were a child and a teenager, did you have any idea of what you wanted to do? None, none at all, honestly. Um, yeah, I think as a young person, I I had no clue. I was a bit of a rebel, honestly. Um, I was academically very, very clever, and I picked things up really quickly. You got super um, high IQ, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've probably done some damage to it over the years, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I was I was officially accepted. I was tested and officially accepted into the UK's National Academy of Gifted and Talented Youth, which um, which at the time meant that my IQ was about one hundred and fifty, something like that, or one hundred and fifty and above. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a, a sort of a, a small group of of young people that were sort of accepted into that, and it was it was great for the school. You know, it kind of put some context to some of the challenges they were having with me which was I'd turn up to lessons I really didn't care but then whenever there were exams I kind of did I did okay um so yeah I, I I think I think because I was academically quite smart I always felt like I didn't really have to make that much effort and planning for the yeah, future didn't really seem yeah like pla- just planning it just didn't really seem that important I kind of always probably a bit arrogant, honestly. I probably always thought that things would just be fine. Um, And yeah, I I sort of, I left school when I was 16. I I tried to do college. I tried to do university. It just wasn't for me. Um, And I I actually went, I went through so many different jobs. Like I worked in call centers. I started a hairdressing course. (laughs) That Uh, always always makes me laugh. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I qualified. I did my MVQ level two in that. And I, I worked in retail, um, but I got fired from almost every job I ever had. You know, I wasn't a good employee. I mm. think that rebellious streak stuck with me throughout my sort of teenage years and into my early 20s. Um, right. I think coupled with the fact that I'd, you know, with a bit of money in my pocket and and I sort of discovered clubbing and you know, all the stuff that comes with that. And I think I I lack direction. I really lack direction. But I think one thing, one thing that was for sure that I figured out early was that I hated working for other people. Um, And I think I was probably 18, 19 when I started getting ideas about working for myself. And I had no idea what that would look like. I didn't really have any skills um, other than the ability to learn. Uh, But I was always fascinated by design and I loved uh, I loved web technology and so that kind of that really for me was the first sort of branch into entrepreneurialism you know I I spent a lot of time learning graphic design I spent a lot of time understanding code and building websites and picked up was really lucky actually I picked up a couple of contracts through the nightclub work that I was doing and um, yeah, that was sort of it, really. I, re- I remember the day that I got paid my first ever invoice. You know, I'd never mm-hmm. never made an invoice before. It was like a, a whole new thing. I didn't know what one was. And uh, I remember sending it to the guy that owned the club. And, um, you know, within a couple of days, the money was in my bank. And it's... it's um, it's addictive, you know, it's like, it's like a, a, I immediately realized, you know, wow, there's a world of opportunity here. And I, I've, you know, I've got something that's valuable. Uh, and yeah, that, that was my first business. What about you? Uh, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. Definitely mm. when I was at school, I hated school, really. I, it was rubbish. Yeah. Um, I got really average grades. I just didn't, I just, I just didn't enjoy it for various reasons, but um, I didn't bother with the university. So I, I did yeah. a, a college, this college course in IT and I was really interested in tech. Like I loved tech as a kid. I loved computers. I loved PCs. Like I, like I used to assemble PCs and I also learned to write That's a little cool. bit of code and stuff like that, which you may not even know about that, but um, <laughs> so I, so, you know, I was very interested in hardware, software, um, and just cool, new, exciting technologies. Um, 
but I did the year the year at college and it was awful. Like I was just I was bored out my brains and it seemed completely pointless. And on the side I was working for a mobile phone network. I was working for O2. And in the end yeah. I just went to work for O2 full time. Best decision mm. I ever made. Best company I've ever worked for. I was a good employee. Um <laughs> that's where I think we're different. It's like I can't like I was I worked my nuts off. I worked so hard yeah. and I was really successful at that job. I like at 20, I had like, I was running one of the company's flagship retail stores and um, it was like top of the, like top five in the company based on all the different stats and wow. that. And I did a really great job. And I, but, I guess really I just wanted to be good at doing something and I found mm. something I was good at doing and threw myself into it. And I didn't yeah. really understand business. I was interested in business. I'd always like nice things, I'd like nice cars, uh, like, you know, some of the finer things in life, but I didn't understand money and how money works particularly. Um, and then after that, I just had a series of sort of sales jobs, but I, I liked being in control of my income to a certain extent. So I always had jobs where I could earn bonuses and commissions. And that worked really well for me. You know, I'm very good at building relationships, rapport with people, building personal networks. It's why, why, you know, I'm successful in business in so many ways is because I can bring people together and share a vision. And, um, yeah. And then, uh, eventually I, I was working for a small business and I was like, I could run a business, I could do something. So I ended up doing that and started my own business and um, started reading things like um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is one of the best yeah. books ever written on money. The classics. Yeah, Robert Kiyosaki's. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot in it that you can laugh at now. And it's a bit outdated, but the principles are incredible, you know, and this kind of stuff should have been taught in schools and probably still isn't. I, I would imagine i read like the tim ferris four hour work week i learned about like geo arbitrage and how mm. to like hire workforces overseas and um how to have a location independent business so you can have the lifestyle you want and that's where it all kind of started really so i was a bit of a late i wasn't a young you know early 20s entrepreneur it took me really probably um later on in my 20s to really which is still very young anyway but to yeah. really really believe and understand how to do business and uh once i once i understood it um i just kept trying and failing trying and failing and then i won and yeah. then and then you know the rest is history really we've we've built what three companies together three together three yeah. together one yeah, each we have. What, one, one each separately um, I was I was going to say it's it's interesting that you talk about failure because I've had my fair share of failure too you know I think I'm a big believer actually in failing upwards and I think every failure is an opportunity to learn and I know that's cliche but it you know it really is and I think I was fortunate enough to start in business early on you know my first business was at 21 years old mm. um I'm 32 this year um so it's almost you know just over a decade of of learning learning um, and my hit rate in business is has been pretty low you know the first few things that I tried to get off the ground failed I've only really had one major success which was the famous company and that was my mm. um, that was my music industry business that you you mentioned and um, yeah I mean that was that was really significant I mean we had 300 independent music clients on the books we raised a million dollars in private equity opened a recording studio out in LA and it was big. I think uh, looking back, I mean, it, uh, ultimately the, the expansion project didn't work out. Um, and I think that that was as a result of just my leadership skills. I think I, I, you know, it was a real good opportunity for me to learn what I didn't know. Um, and as a 25 year old guy trying to run a 13,000 square foot office and studio complex in LA and a UK based office with a, you know, a sizable team was just, just hard i mean i didn't i didn't have any mentors and i know that you're a a big believer in having good mentors you know people that have been there walk the walk and kind of can impart some wisdom so i was really sort of fumbling through it but as i say it was a it was a great great lesson and i think you know take all of taking all of that learning into what we've done together um has meant that we've been able to build some really brilliant cash flowing businesses in I don't think you'd mind me saying some quite boring sectors. Oh, I love a good old boring business. <laughs> me too. I, I love like it. the model. 
I love, I, I, love a, I love a good boring business. You know, waste management Same. and recycling. We've got another. Yeah. We've got another business that we've we're now growing out. We've got a marketing agency, which is more to run all our own ideas through. We have some some yeah. clients we work for, um, but crypto is not boring. And I'll tell you what this is my favorite business we've done and it's not the biggest and it probably never will be but i mm. get the most joy out of crypto pearls up like, compared to everything else and, and i think it just scratches that creative itch that i have you know and you're way more creative than i am so I, you know I hope, I hope this gives you some creativity oh, it does um but those but, but you mentioned about cash flow and businesses and i'm just going to say this again to any, for anybody that's missed it on previous episodes but the holy grail of successful being successful in the crypto space is having cash flowing assets so your only income mm. isn't a job because if your only income is a job with a set amount it's very hard to get ahead in the crypto space because you're doing what every single retail investor does is putting a small amount in when there's euphoria in the market and not risking the, your small amount of capital when it when there's a lot of fear and that's most people in the space if you've got cash flowing businesses that you can take profits out of and put mm -hmm. it into the crypto market if that's what you want to do not advice but if that's what you're doing you'll be far more successful because you have the ability to make more cash more revenue so if you make some losses it's fine you can make up for them um otherwise it just wouldn't have been possible for us to do what we've done yeah i completely agree i mean at my mantra and, and yours i think are very similar which is you know to build wealth you have to have multiple sources of income and i think especially when you're young we you know we say this on the show is you you can afford to play on the riskier end of speculation um mm. and actually i think you know i'd probably encourage it i think where the risk reward or the risk return is is high um, you know, have a go at it. And I think that's what we've done with crypto. One thing I would say, though, is, you know, as as I'm getting a little older, I think diversification and having um, more stable assets in my investment portfolio is is important. And we are, you know, we are now should diversifying we, into we other things. Should talk about this? Are you happy to talk about what we're, yeah, what we're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. So we have a couple of cash flow businesses, one of which is, is this podcast. Um, you know, but the other businesses represent more of the cash flow, and what mm. we, you know, we take some money out to make sure that we can we can eat and, you know, yeah, do nice things. We're quite um, low maintenance, really, aren't we? Pay the mortgage, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's left? We we're investing into real estate, as you Americans call it, but property, as we say, mm. um, and we've just got a simple strategy um, of. Um, we call it just crystallizing gains. So um, yep. I don't think property is going to produce a fantastic yield. But what no. it does do is it means that it's what I like about it now. At the Because I was never interested in doing property because I was like, I put money in, it sat there. I can't do anything with it. It's illiquid. I can't until I can remortgage maybe in a few years. And it doesn't make me more money. It ties that capital up. But when you've got multiple cash flowing assets, you can then move it into real estate to, um, yeah, to crystallize those gains. And over time, it will go up in value, but it's a really good inflation hedge. And what it also means is if your cash flowing assets aren't doing too well in a few years, or you want to take your foot off the gas, you can turn some of those, those, um, some of those properties into cash flowing assets. So that's kind of like our, our game really is to do that and then probably move on to some like bigger um, building and property type projects as the years go on. I know there's a big one I'm looking at in a different country yeah. at the minute. Um, that's really our plan. So, mm. um, and, and for me, like I love crypto for what, like the, the innovation is incredible. I love the philosophy of Bitcoin. Um, but ultimately, you know, we are long term investors and entrepreneurs. And, you know, if I thought one day that, you know, crypto wasn't the place to be, then, you know, it would be it would be something different. But ultimately, right. it allows us to create the lives that we want and be an example to other people so they can see what we've done. And you kind of like uh, send the elevator back down, as I think it's Peter Drucker that said that. Um, yeah, rather than pull the ladder up underneath you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> which, which a lot, a lot of successful people do. So, mm. um, yeah, that's our that's our plan, really. 
I hope that inspires some people. You know, we both have come from nothing. We've both, yeah, we're like literally yeah. zero. We've not I, been absolutely, gifted, yeah. A, 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 you know, we've not inherited loads of money. We've not so, been handed none, a business. A zilch. I haven't uh, got yeah. a bloody degree. <laughs> you know, got a bang average IQ. I've just literally got an insane work ethic, and I don't yeah. give up. And so, if yeah. people are listening to this and think, "Yeah, I want to do," you know, "I want to do something big with my life," it, it's it's all learnable you know listen to more podcasts find great books start talking to yeah. people like what you did about like when you said it's hard to when you had that group of friends when you're in your early 20s that you just couldn't talk about wealth building with mm. then then you know you met me and we started talking about stuff if you don't have anybody then um go and find people totally it's it's so true i mean the saying is that you're the average of the five closest people to you in your life mm. and um and that's not to say that you should you know ditch friends friends that don't don't support you on your on your mission um at all but it does mean that you should try and just immerse yourself in the world that you want to be in and whether that's going to the odd networking event just getting out i mean there's so much that's online now you can join online and digital communities we live in an information age any information that you need to be able to build a business is available on youtube um, there's a tutorial somewhere that will help you through setting up a basic website, setting up your social channels, um, the kind of content that you should be creating for an audience. Um, and it is, it, you know, so much of this is accessible. So many of the tools that we have available to us are free. So, you know, it's it, I think for so many people, it's um, it's a fear thing. I think fear of failure, fear of the unknown. Uh, not knowing uh, whether, you know, it's something that's going to work for them. But I, I think you just have to bite the bullet and you have to take the first step. And failing is fine. In fact, failing is more than fine. Failing is is beneficial. Um, so if you give something a go and it doesn't work out, try again. Um, I can honestly say with my hand on my heart, I've, I've probably tried to launch over 30 businesses. When I had the music business, you know, the amount of offshoots of that that we tried to launch that were subsidiaries of that music company. Um, you know, we tried to do uh, mentoring, we tried to do education, we tried to do um, digital mentoring content. It's you know, so much that we tried and actually invested a lot of money in trying to create some of this stuff. And it just didn't didn't work out. Uh, I think now as, as we've kind of gotten into this, I think you and I both have the same idea about doubling down on the things that work. Um, oh, it's actually, it, it it's not about diversification in, in business really. It's about picking the, the fastest horses in the race and uh, cutting everything else and focusing on those. And that that as a strategy for us has been brilliant. You know, focus on the, the cash generating assets, allocate that capital to property or other investments. Um, and that seems to be working okay for now. Yeah, I agree. Um, we said like a few moments ago about like multiple streams of income are great. One thing that I learned the lesson is that you need to make sure if you've got a business that your main business is really solid before you start looking at the next thing. Mm. Because entrepreneurs have that shiny object syndrome, um, you know, magpies, if you like, where they're like, oh, Novelty another bias. Thing, another thing. And, you know, that's sometimes good, but you really need to give your main business full attention and get make sure it works without you pretty much or certainly without you there full time and then move to the next thing so yeah it's just, much easier to double the revenue of the business that you're already in than to set up something new and achieve a similar level of revenue um it's that compounding effect isn't it it's like small incremental changes day by day yeah and uh, that's how you build one good business and i think i mean we've taken everything that we've we've learned independently and you know we've built a uh, a really sizable advisory business, which, you know, we're, we're sort of building and planning to sell in the coming years. And that, that's been, you know, that's been amazing, but I don't think we could have done it as quickly as we have if we hadn't have sort of learned those lessons before. No. Yeah. That knowledge base does compound. You just got to stick at it. For sure. Mm. Um, should we, should we move on to like some quick fire questions? Yeah, go for it. All right. Um, so we've got some, we've got some, some, quick fire questions i might just change these around slightly um, <laughs> okay you love music obviously I who do. is one artist or band as your favorite and one album what would it be 
Uh, okay, my my favorite album's a really cheesy one. Uh, it's, this is difficult, but my favorite album is by Mika, and it's called Life in Cartoon Motion. And oh, it's, okay. He uh, so he kind of he's a, a a British Israeli artist. Probably, I'm sure people know who he is. Um, but he he sounds a lot like Freddie Mercury, and he kind of came out of the woodworks in 2007, I think, with his first album. And it was just really unique, very artistic, very against the grain. Every song on there was nothing like what was going on in the charts. And I still enjoy listening to it today. Okay, all right, I did not know that. <laughs> what, what's yours? Um, so I'm I'm probably not into music as much as you. I mean, you set up a business in it, but well, I would say all time favorite band, the Pet Shop Boys. I mean, I've got some of their vinyls that I'm looking at on my wall. I would say I'm that, seeing what, them this week. Oh, you, oh, you're a Glastonbury, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. So I, I really admire. I mean, I like, I like the music. I like '80s stuff and synth pop and stuff like that. But I would say what what they've managed to do is really inspiring because they've sort of transcended every single decade from like probably the very start of the 80s maybe the the end of the 70s really but the start mm. of the 80s 90s noughties the 10s is that a thing and the 20s you know and they've remained they tried to remain current and their music's changed and i think you know the, what's that 40 40 years of of of, of being some um, like yeah. you know being one of the top bands and groups in the world so yeah i'd, I'd probably say them album wise i don't nice. know so maybe just two more of these quick fires before okay. we wrap up for this week because we could talk about ourselves all day long it's our favorite subject um yes. <laughs> it's a bit self-indulgent uh, at times this episode i think but also i think there's a lot of stuff in here that people find really useful because i, I get told regularly that when we tell our personal stories it helps people in some way so that's kind of really our aim here rather than just to sort of talk about ourselves Totally. I also think just to add to that is, you know, people listen to the show and wonder what the hell we actually know about business. You know, we get some great business leaders on here and mm. we, we, we often quiz them. Yeah. Um, so I think it's worth just adding some context. So, you know, we, we've, we've got some experience in this space. The podcast is something that we started to learn more, but now actually, you know, I think we're in a position to sort of, uh, I don't know, to do some investigations into some of these companies, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> quick fire question. Uh, city or countryside? Where would you rather be? Uh, I'll go with my first thought, which is countryside. Okay. But okay. But I think both, because I, I would like sometimes in the countryside and sometimes in a city. Split mm. my time. Yeah, good answer. Volatile coin or slow and stable coin? Oh, I love a volatile coin. <laughs> yeah, same. same. Uh, I mean, stable coin, I, I, what... You, I don't understand the question. Or a slow and stable coin. I mean, something that sort of like creeps up. Do you, do you want something that's volatile, that's crazy, or something that's sort of slow and steady creeping up over? I mean, they don't really exist, do they? Because they all go in market cycles. But I, I would personally, for trading, I'd personally want something that was a bit more volatile. Yeah, okay. Well, may, maybe, maybe we could just finish on this is mm. like, what are your like what are your two favorite cryptos if you had to if you had a portfolio and you could only buy two cryptos what would they be um and also like where did where do you see the this this whole um digital currency decentralization web3 sector in in a decade i think anything more than that is almost impossible to predict but yeah. a decade we might be able to have a go at um so yeah, yeah, let's let's end on those two things. So my favorite cryptos, well, mm. Bitcoin, you know, it was the first one that I bought back in 2011, um, foolishly with money that was lent to me for groceries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were hungry for a week, but I yeah, mean, it I was, worked really yeah, well, right? <laughs> it, it, it played out all right. Um, so I would say Bitcoin. And secondly, I would say is Kadena. Um, just because, just because I'm a huge fan of what they're building, I think it's one of the strongest layer one um, blockchains, and and has uh, a lot of 
uh, a lot of exciting stuff ahead of it. And in terms of where I see the space in 10 years, I think it's um, I think it's still taking form. I can't say for sure. Uh, I think it will have a place. I think Bitcoin will certainly have a place as a scarce digital asset. Um, whether there's any sort of um, second layer payment protocols which are used... Uh, you know, at scale. I don't know. I don't know is the answer. I think, um, you know, it, it will become what it becomes. I don't have any any strong predictions. So favorite crypto is obviously Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the more the more time goes on, I feel like I become more of a Bitcoin maxi because there's so many there's so many projects out there that I think just are not going to survive this this bear market. However, there are some that definitely will, or I think almost definitely will. And I'm I'm with you. Like Kadeen is the one that's blown me away the most, so I'd probably mm. pick that if I had to ha hold to. Um, you know, and we're going to be doing some collaboration work with them. Like full disclosure there, but the reason we're doing that is because we really believe in what they're building. So I would say. Yeah, and and there'll be uh, there'll be other blockchain solutions out there as well. But I I, I like their proof of work, their scalable proof of work model. Um, so yeah, I, yes. I would pick those. And where I see it in ten years, um, I, we will see some some forms of CBDCs. I don't know how far that will go. No. Hopefully, not as far as you know what we've spoken about previously. Um, I think that's inevitable. Like it's just that's going to happen. Um, I think we're going to see way more Web3 platforms. Um, mm. it's, hard, it's hard to predict. Like the financial system stuff is hard to predict. Um, I, I think with, with Bitcoin, we will just see, we'll, we will see this being used. I, I think the network effect of Bitcoin will be one of the most explosive things that we'll ever see apart from the internet. I really do think that. And I don't think, I don't think we've even started yet. If you look at what's being built with the Lightning Network and the whole integration with things like Square and, you know, there's other payment platforms that are going to integrate it. So um, yeah. that's all I could predict, really. So, nice. yeah, going back to the original question of which two cryptos would I hold, I you know, Kadena, yeah, but a hundred percent Bitcoin. Like, you know, if if you had to pick one, it would always be Bitcoin, wouldn't it? Because that's the thing everybody will will want, and it really will be a scarce asset. Um, I think what Michael Saylor says is right. I just don't know on what time scale he's right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we've said before, he'll either go down as one of the greatest investors in history or a complete lunatic. Um, but time will tell. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks so much for listening to this. I hope you've got to know us a little bit better over the last yeah. 50 odd minutes. Wow, okay, <laughs> it's a bit of a long one, um, but we had a lot to say. And the reason we're doing this, so this is Monday, the 20th of June, 2022. Normally we'd be recording this at the end of the week and doing one of our mm. weekly shows. The reason we're not doing that is because you're in Glastonbury, which I is am. really amazing. Um, yeah. And we've been wanting to do this one for a while. Um, and it mm. seemed like the perfect opportunity. So we'll be back to business as usual the following week. Um, so we'll catch you then. We hope you enjoyed this episode. It would mean the world to us if you could leave a review wherever you're listening. This really does help and allows other people to find us online. You can keep up to date with new releases of the podcast, by subscribing and following us on Twitter or Instagram for the latest crypto related news. Information provided by Crypto Pulse via this podcast, website, social media channels, and any other medium does not constitute financial advice, investment recommendations, or any other type of advice whatsoever. The Crypto Pulse team are not professional financial advisors. Trading and purchasing cryptocurrencies do carry risks, and anybody wishing to partake in such activities should seek professional advice.